Well, good evening, everybody. How are you tonight? It is March 19th, 2024, and here we go with the word of encouragement. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, well, again, as, as is our norm, we'll get kicked off in a couple minutes. Uh, people will be popping on, and uh, then we'll open in a word of prayer, and, and we're going to jump in, um, and we're going to we're going to talk about um, life, uh, the life that Jesus came to give, and um, you know how, uh, in assuring that um, His anointing carried uh, so much power to break off of all of us, uh, including myself, to break off of us um, the things that would imprison us, uh, the things that would really kind of lock us into a mold of something we were never intended to be and so that's that's some of the things we're going to talk about uh tonight and we will kick it in high gear praise the lord in just a minute or two and there we go minya god bless you and patty and larry and Kathy, my dear sister and my friend. Love you, Kathy. God bless you. Bernice and Rhoda. Everybody's popping on. All right. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. Uh, let's just uh, see where we're going to go with this. And um, as I was saying, um, we are going to talk about the uh, the life that Jesus came to give you and with that um, you know it's it's just amazing to me how um, God has so much for us that we um, uh, really need to be so thankful for um, okay <clears throat> all right Tony Ward my friend God bless you um, Again, we'll just take one more minute, and then we're going to jump on in here and uh, and get cranking. Uh, but the message tonight, if you are looking for a title, is uh, Jesus Gives Life. And we're going to break that down. Uh, we're going to travel a little bit uh, through, um, uh, through the gospel and an epistle and an Old Testament passage. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of take a, a little bit from all over the Bible uh, to talk about that. Tony, I can't wait to see you soon, buddy. Praise God. So, um, we're going to get cranking in about 30 seconds. Let's just uh, continue to uh, welcome those who are popping on. And uh, praise the Lord for that. I really do appreciate uh, this. Now, um, <clears throat> There are two Tuesdays in April in which I will not be doing the word of encouragement because my wife and I are going on um, a, 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 uh, an anniversary birthday vacation that we had planned before COVID uh, that we had to postpone for like three years now. Um, and, uh, and we had been saving up for that for some time. So I'm looking forward to that. I believe it's going to be... Let me see if I have the dates right. Uh, the um, oh, Sandy, God, it was so great to see you in church on Sunday. Praise the Lord! <laughs> I was really thankful for that. That was a blessing. All right, well, let me open in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. And I got to think of these two dates um, in April. Um, um, Someone just popped on, and I'm trying to figure out who that is, but thank you for coming on with us. We appreciate that. Claudette is on as well, giving a nice hi to the family of God. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name uh, for everything. <laughs> everything we have that's a blessing originates from you. And God, we do pray that we would learn how to let go of the things that you want to remove from us so we can be all you intended us to be. God, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen, guys. Um, we're talking about the fact that Jesus gives life. Now, this is important to recognize because there are so many 
uh, competing factors that try to come against us in this day and age. Hey, Maria, God bless you. So good to see your smile. Um, so many things do come against us um, in this day and age. And so, um, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Noreen. Um, praise the Lord. Well, praise God. Um, all right. As I was saying, Jesus came to give us life, and um, I am so grateful for that. But we recognize um, that man, um, in trying to figure out who we are before we knew Christ, and you know, sometimes that lingers when we come to know Christ. Um, you know, our, we go through an identity crisis of, of how can God use me? There's the wave I look for. Hey, Barbara Gray, God bless you. Um, you know, guys, a, a little um, um, testimony here. Um, when I was first saved, um, the first word of baptism I ever saw was Barbara Grace. And I didn't know what to think of anything. I was, you know, so new in the Lord. And I was so overwhelmed with, uh, with joy over, um, um, you know, her being baptized and the way she shared her faith. And the joy on her face and so um, Barbara I want to thank you for that you you were instrumental in me st staying in the fellowship because I I really didn't know what to make of the people in the church I loved uh, you know I, I fell in love with Jesus gave my life to Jesus um, but the culture um, the church culture was brand new to me and it was culture shock but you you kind of were one of the tools that God used to help me so Thank you for that. Um, isn't it amazing how God uses people um, to draw us closer to Him? And so that's a blessing um, that I had for uh, for Barbara. That was in 1981. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I think you were the last word of baptism at Old Evangel, as a matter of fact. Um, John L. Camo, my teaching friend. Praise the Lord. He's with us as well. All right, we're talking about the fact that Jesus gives life and... Um, you know, the anointing that he carried for that is amazing. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that from uh, Luke chapter 4 and Isaiah 61. But before we get there, let's go to um, John chapter 10. I'm going to read just two verses. Now, John chapter 10 is, is a tremendous chapter about uh, that Jesus is the good shepherd. and But 10 and 11 uh, talk about the fact that Jesus came to free us up of the thief, the one who is, is an identity thief. Um, he's a destiny thief, um, and he's a hope thief. Um, and so, so many times, uh, you know, we might feel hopeless in certain situations, but I just want to tell you something, that uh, God is greater than our hopelessness because he is the God of hope. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, guys. John 10 verses 10 and 11 the thief comes uh, the thief does not come except to do one of three things to steal to kill and to destroy now what 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 is it that he's stealing well do you know that um, the Bible tells us uh, hey Kathy God bless you thank you for popping on the Bible tells us that um, in Psalm 139 that we're fearfully and wonderfully made and before we were formed in our, our, our mother's womb, God, God knew every day that, that we would live. And, and uh, he wrote it in his book. He actually wrote about us. Um, there's a book about you that uh, Jesus holds. And it wouldn't be amazing to have him read the page of the day that you're living every morning when you wake up with God. And I believe he can do that. I believe he wants to do that. Um, and that is the anointing he carries to come back. Uh, the tools of the enemy and we know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper uh, praise the Lord um, thank you Barbara it was uh, thank God it was indoors right praise the Lord uh, the water was cold but uh, at least it was inside um, all right so here we are the thief uh, only comes to do one of three things to steal to kill and destroy 
uh, to steal your destiny, to steal your future, to steal your hope, to kill your, your uh, um, that, that God hunger in you that, that we're all born with, because we're all born with, with, with an empty thing that we know, our conscience tells us, that uh, that there's something more than what we're living, and the enemy comes to try to kill that and and to destroy any hope that we might have. So he's a he's a destroyer of hope, um, and so now in dealing with that, Jesus combats that, counteracts it, and victoriously overcomes it. Now here's how Jesus uh, combats that. He says, "But I have come, Jesus speaking, that you might have life." and have it more abundantly. Um, uh, in Hebrew, the word life is l'chaim, and, uh, uh, you know, to life, uh, l'chaim, uh, to, the, to the life that God wants for you. So I want to tell you something. Um, your best days start right now. Um, the best part of your life is, is, is in your next breath, and everything that transpires beyond that. And so I just want to bless you in this. It's 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 just real tonight is just a simple word of encouragement. Um, so Jesus comes. He's the good shepherd, right? He comes to give us life. He comes to give us back a sense, you know, because some uh, excuse me, Jeremiah twenty nine says um, he has plans for us, and he knows the plans. So if you don't know the plans, don't get worried, because God knows them, and they're for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so um, our identity is sealed in God and Jesus can unseal the mystery of our identity um, as we go to him and he speaks to us. God bless you, Dolly. So glad you're checking in with us. Always great to see your beautiful smile. Praise the Lord. Um, all right, so we recognize that the devil comes to steal our destiny. Uh, to rob us of hope and to destroy any sense of, of satisfaction of life that, that we might have. But Jesus counteracts that by giving us life. Now, when he, when he uses this phrase, now, if you understand the context um, uh, or the continuity of, of what Jesus gives, the life he gives is eternal. And it begins when you allow him to dwell inside of you. Oh, my Florida friends that I grew up with in church. God bless you, Ralph and Rosa. Praise the Lord. Um, and let's, let's, let's look at the anointing. See, Jesus didn't just come to, to forgive us of sin. Jesus came to give us a born-again experience to be born back into not just relationship with God, but into the destiny that God gave you when he planned your birth. Okay, your birth was not a mistake, believe it or not. How, however it came about, your birth was never a mistake. God always had you on his heart and on his mind, and your design was originated and perfected in the will of God and he spoke you into existence you know you go to the creation story God's word speaks everything into existence he spoke you into existence so the anointing he carried back to planet earth remember uh, in in Matthew chapter 4 Jesus begins his public ministry after his his water baptism and uh, 40 days of fasting as the spirit led him into the wilderness and being tempted of the devil three different times but after that, Jesus begins his public ministry with one statement. Repent because the kingdom of God is in his hand. And he's extending it personally to all those that will receive it. Uh, God will never force anything upon you. Everything that God uh, offers you is, is uh, by invitation. And uh, uh, my question to you is, are you receiving what God is extending to you? And are you renouncing and rejecting all the things that the devil might be tempting you with? Um, you can't have both. Um, and, I, I, and I want to b believe with you uh, that the life that Jesus gives is so much greater than the one who steals, kills, and destroys, right? Because his life is abundant. 
And so he had to carry an anointing to come, not just to rescue us or save us for sin, but to remake us, reshape us, reform us, give us the mind of Christ. And so in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21, let me read that. Um, because Jesus is the living word and he came to bring hope to the hopeless and to give us back the life he intended. So here's the anointing he carried. It says in verse 16 in Luke chapter 4, okay, that's where we are now. We'll read down to verse 21. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, this is from Isaiah 61. Hey, Ronnie, how you doing? God bless you. Um, this is, uh, he's quoting Isaiah 61. So verse 18, he starts to read the book that was handed to him. Now, you have to recognize that according to the Jewish um, liturgy, it is set up that every Sabbath, hi Rosa, God bless you. Oh, I'm so excited that you're with us. Um, every Sabbath, according to the Jewish calendar, the liturgy or, or the scripture reading was, was planned out so that every synagogue was reading the same text of Torah um, on any one particular Sabbath. So he's handed uh, what he's reading now, and every other synagogue in the known world at that time is reading that. Um, but now Jesus adds something to it um, in the presence of those he is now quoting Isaiah 61 to. Verse 18 of Luke 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Remember, without God, um, we are not just uh, bankrupt spiritually, but we are dead spiritually. Um, so poverty, the poverty of heart, the poverty of soul is, 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 is so destitute. Why? Because there is no spiritual element. We are made up of three entities, right? Body, soul, and spirit. And if our body and soul are living without a, a spirit made alive, <laughs> We are really in poverty. Uh, we are bankrupt uh, completely. And so Jesus came uh, to preach the word, the gospel of the kingdom to the poor. And he goes on to say this. Um, the spirit of the Lord has sent him. Jesus says he sent me to heal the broken hearted. Now the Bible tells us um, that Jesus is near to the broken hearted. Um, isn't it amazing that that was a prophecy of this? Uh, let me just get it for you. Um, I believe it's in Psalms. Uh, yes, Psalm 34, 18. Uh, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit or a humble spirit, right? So the Lord is near the broken hearted. Um, this is almost in, in a prophetic uh, uh, foretaste of the anointing that Jesus would carry to give us life. Um, he says that he was sent to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. He breaks off anxieties, depression, oppression. Now, oppression is different than depression. Okay, depression, uh, there, there's, there's chemical imbalances that can bring on uh, depression, but, but to be oppressed is to be harassed by the enemy. Remember, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come to counteract that and to break the curse of the enemy and to break his power over your life and to give you the identity that he spoke into existence when you were formed in your mother's womb. And so... Here, he sets at liberty those who are oppressed. Oppression is an external attack that comes from the enemy. Now, depression is an internal conflict um, of torment that can be self-inflicted or physically inflicted uh, by chemical imbalances because of stress. Because of worry, because of anxieties, those things will attack internally. But oppression is different. 
Oppression is an external attack of the enemy. All right. Now, uh, this anointing that he carries is to give us every bit of life that God intended us to have. And it's a rich anointing and it lacks nothing. It is, it is complete in its power to set you at liberty and to bring freedom and hope back into your life. How does it do that? It does that by creating this born again encounter where your spirit now rises from the dead. <laughs> do you know that, that you have an immediate resurrection of life inside of you the minute you say yes to Jesus. Why? Because a dead spirit now is born again, comes alive. Now, instead of body, soul, and spirit, you know, where the spirit was dead, now you are spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit, man, takes the lead. And now we begin to see that the anointing that Jesus brought when he walked planet Earth, is the anointing that we have right now to live in freedom and to live at the highest level of the life that God intended. All right. So he goes on to say this in verse 19. Uh, also to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. What makes this year different than any other year? Because Messiah has come to bring the kingdom of God into your life. That's so good, Maria. No more dry bones, right? Can these dry bones live in Ezekiel? Um, <laughs> this, this, this year of God's favor is on us right now. And so I, I just want to speak that in, into, your, into your life. Um, John, thank you. Uh, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God gave us redemption and what? New life. See, this is key because um, there are times when I'm sad uh, for no reason and I don't know why. And there are times when um, I feel overwhelmed. And there are times when, when my soul starts to chine, kind of rise up against what is spiritually my new reality. And so I've got to be like the psalmist David when he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. In other words, I've got to let my spirit man lead. I've got to put him back in charge. And I've got to speak it into existence by telling my soul, wait a minute. <laughs> God's anointing, the anointing of Jesus Christ was more than enough that I would live in the joy of the Lord, which is my strength. I am born again. I am spiritually led. I am, I am not lacking any good thing. This is this 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 is what helps me. Um, uh, I talk to myself um, based on what, based on the finished work of the cross. But not only that, based on what Jesus brought with him when he walked in planet Earth, even before the crucifixion, right before the forgiveness of sins. Jesus came with anointings to break off the bonds of, 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 of slavery to sin. Um, okay? Um, and uh, yes, I like that, uh, John. Uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Um, and there's a whole story built around how he did that. Amen? Uh, in the Old Testament when he was still uh, anointed as king but not reigning as king. Saul was still king and hunting him down. Uh, but he had lost everything by marauders and uh, they had stolen uh, um, all of their goods when he and his men were out, um, uh, you know, uh, um, riding and looking um, um, and, and uh, you know, doing what, what they were doing um, while they had left the camp. The camp was unprotected and it was, uh, it was raided um, um, uh, by a, a, a heathen nation. And they took wives and children and all of their goods. Um, and then uh, the depression came upon David, right? Uh, the men were crying, ripping their clothes and tearing at themselves and saying, how could this happen? And they even were thinking of stoning David. Uh, and David pulled himself away. He got alone with God. And it says in the text, uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord. 
and then asked God what he should do. And God told them, go pursue those who stole from you and you will recover every single thing. And so David did, and he, and he did recover everything. It's a tremendous story on the anointing of God. Uh, you know, the Bible um, also in Joel chapter 2 tells us that God will restore the years. Now think about this. God will restore the years that the locust have eaten. Now, what does locust represent? Well, <laughs> locust is a plague. Um, it is a plague um, um, uh, of judgment, but it's also a plague um, um, of the enemy to destroy your harvest or your blessing, right? What do locusts do? They destroy um, a crop when it is ready for harvest. Um, and when your life is, is, is ready for a blessing or the favor of God, um, um, uh, the enemy wants to try to send locusts to devour that um, before you can actually um, uh, pick the harvest or reap the harvest of blessing. Um, but Joel says God will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. You are in a, in, in a restorative season because the acceptable year of the Lord is upon you. Right? We just read that in Luke 4.19. Now it says this in verse 20 of Luke 4. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he said this, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. No other synagogue heard that except the one in which he was preaching at in Nazareth. Today is the fulfillment of that text. If you will accept it, you will will have your poverty broken, your spiritual um, depravity uh, healed. You will have your broken heart healed. You will have anything that tried to help hold you captive now uh, uh, broken and you will receive the liberty of God, the freedom of God. You will be able to see where you were once blind. Now you'll be able to see with God, the things of God, and the things that God wants to perform in you and through you. You will also recognize that anything coming against you to try to induce oppression, you will be almost as though you have this barrier around you, this anointing where any oppressive attacks can never ever get to you. Um, all these things are at your avail. Uh, why? Because this is the anointing that Jesus carried, and he said it is fulfilled. Now, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, is where he was quoting. All right, so let's jump in there real quick. And then I, I want to get to you um, with some of the areas where God did this for several people. Now, he did this for many people, but I, I just want to highlight a few. All right, so here we are. In Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3, uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken heart and proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn. Now, God is... An, uh, he is extending vengeance against all those <laughs> that have come against you. All, all, he's extending vengeance on curses, on, uh, um, on false reputations, on lies, uh, on the attack on your identity that the enemy enacted. Uh, he is uh, enacting vengeance on all of those things. In other words, he is, is destroying it. He is slaying the dragon of your life and my life. And he goes on to say here uh, um, uh, in verse 3, to console those who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Now Jesus um, the anointing he carried 
will perfect all of this in our lives. So let's talk a little bit about verse 3. Um, I don't know um, when when you lose um, a loved one or, or you lose, you know, sometimes people, when they, they lose um, something or someone in their life, they, they stop living. Um, uh, it, it is that painful, um, and this is no fault of them, but but why am I bringing this up? It, it's because Jesus, in the Word of God, in Him quoting the anointing that is uh, uh, talked about in Isaiah 61 from Luke chapter 4, He's telling us that He wants to give us the oil of joy for mourning. All right? Uh, in other words, what is the oil of joy uh, uh, for? When someone comes out of a, a state of mourning, um, um, usually in, 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 the, in the Old Testament, especially in, you know, even in Jesus' day, um, mourning was depicted by sackcloth and ashes. Um, and and uh, there was no eating involved. Um, it was a, a very... Um, I, I don't even know how to explain how, how deep um, uh, of, a, uh, of a sense of loss uh, that brings someone into this state of mourning with sackcloth and ashes. Um, but what happens when you come out of that is the first thing you do is oil was used to, to, to rejuvenate those things um, which... <laughs> Uh, which needed to come back um, uh, into in, into life, if you will, um, and so the oil of joy was 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 an uh, uh, an application um, that I've now come out of mourning, and my face is brighter, my countenance has been restored, and I want to tell you something. God wants to restore your countenance. Now, let me just say this: when you lose a loved one you will miss them forever that will never end but you will also recognize that god has an assignment for you to live on and the person you lost would wants that for you more than you might want it for yourself we don't stop living at the loss of, of a loved one what we do is we live and we remember also the joy that we had with them but we also remember that when we come out of mourning, out of the sackcloth and ashes, God gives us a new garment. Okay? And so let's just read this and talk a little bit about that, right? He gives us the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Do you know that worship will carry you out of... Uh, so many um, um, situations that bring you uh, um, pain um, and discomfort emotionally, uh, spiritually, uh, physically. Um, you know, uh, how do we overcome? Well, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if we're not joyful in the Lord, in other words, praising Him, worshiping Him, thanking Him, acknowledging that He is Lord God Almighty, and allowing our spirit now uh, to to unlock the key of our worship. Um, see, the enemy in your crisis will try to imprison the very thing that will bring your freedom, which is your love of God and your love of worship. All right? And the enemy wants to try to rob you of that. And Rosa, you're adding so many great points here. Praise God. Um, it is an overcoming strength, the joy that God gives us. Uh, praise the Lord and healing. And, and uh, thank you, Maria. Um, I love when you guys interact and add to it because all of us are blessed by that. Um, so he consoles us in our mourning. He gives us beauty for ashes. Remember, we talked about the fact of, of ash. Uh, uh, sackcloth and ashes he's talking about that here in in the area of mourning right and the, and the oil of joy is the, the coming out of mourning um, he gives us the oil of joy uh, for mourning and then he gives us a new garment we take off the sack sackcloth okay 
it, it, now <laughs> I want to say this um, when you have come out of mourning and you're going into worship how is it that we change garments the garment we're talking about I believe the scripture is talking about is attitude um, <laughs> So let's, let's talk about that. Um, we can't go to worship with an attitude. Um, uh, he gives us the garment of, in other words, if we have an attitude of heaviness, if we have a, um, a, a garment of heaviness, um, um, there's no way we, we, can, we, can, we can worship the Lord effectively. So there's an exchange there, um, an exchange of attitude, an exchange of heart, an exchange of thought, uh, thought, heart, attitude. Okay, those three areas. Um, and he gives us <laughs> um, not just the oil of joy for mourning, but the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. So there's an exchange of, 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 of a sense of heart, a sense of thought, and a sense of attitude. Why? That we may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified the end result of this is now you're going to allow yourself to blossom in the place where God plants you. Now this is so important. What if the place where God planted you was seemingly the cause of your pain? What do you do then? <laughs> you go through this exercise of the anointing of Jesus let him bring back the life he intended for you. You go through the exchange, right? You come out of mourning. You you uh, take off the sackcloth and, and wash off the ashes. You put on the oil of joy, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Um, why? So that you can be a tree that has its roots in the place where God planted you. Don't ever let the devil rob you of the place God planted you. Your local fellowship and the people God brings you around is the place where you will bear the most fruit. That is your your spiritual family. And and God did that. Now, I, I want to tell you something. Um, no church is perfect. Um, there are times when, when the the siblings within a family are going to hurt one another um, but we can't let that derail us from the plan of god if we want to be the trees bearing uh, the fruit of righteousness we've got to stay where god plants us you are the planting of the lord why it ends out by saying this to you you're the planting of the lord that god may be glorified it's for his glory that I stay where he plants me. Because that's where I'm going to blossom. And what is the fruit that's depicted here in the text? In uh, verse 3 of Isaiah 61, it's righteousness. The fruit of doing right things for the right reasons. What are the right reasons for the glory of God? Amen. And a lot of people are amen into that. And Tony Ward is pulling me along. Come on, brother. All right. Praise God. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys, Sandy and Ronnie and Tony and Claudette. Um, all right. Now, let's talk about one individual here where Jesus understood his anointing to set at liberty those who were oppressed. All right. To preach the gospel to the poor to set the captive free, to bring recovery of sight to the blind. Um, let's talk about this one individual, Luke chapter 19. And when I say his name, you're going to know who he is. Okay, guys. <laughs> Amen. We're talking about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was not a likable guy. Uh, he was a tax collector. And, um, but there's something that sets him apart. You see, the anointing that Jesus carried and read about himself in Luke chapter 4 and proclaimed that it was fulfilled, that that scripture was fulfilled in their hearing that uh, in that moment, um, that anointing that he carried was attracted to those who were hungry. 
And there's an individual in the crowd. Now think about this this day. You're talking about thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. Mm -hmm. um, they're just filling. There's no way to get by even. Jesus is coming through. And the crowds are, are, are just all over the place. And, and no one can get through this. Um, but there's one that stands out in the crowd. Not because he was righteous. But because he was hungry. <laughs> Jesus is attracted to those who are hungry for him. So let's read how the text and the story goes. In Luke 19, beginning verse 1, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. And that's so good, Maria. Yeah, his size didn't stop him. Praise God. But he was a chief tax collector, which means that uh, not only was he... Um, uh, able to um, uh, exact uh, a, 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 an exercise of corrupt, uh, corruption, um, he was able to take from every other tax collector's collections as well. Um, and uh, since he was the chief tax collector, he was very well known um, in the area of Jericho, which we're reading about. And uh, behold, uh, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector in verse 2. And he was rich. Man, he was filthy rich. When the Bible says you're rich, you're rich. Right? I mean, he was unbelievably rich. But now verse 3 talks about the hunger of heart that attracted Jesus to him. Now remember, there are, the crowd is so massive. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a crowd like this before. But they are all thronging to get to Jesus. And yet, uh, uh, Jesus is attracted to one person's hunger above any other. It says in verse 3 about Zacchaeus, he sought to see who Jesus was. He didn't want to take the word of anybody. He didn't want to take hearsay. He wasn't worried about the stories that people were telling on the streets. His heart was hungry to see for himself, to have a personal encounter with Jesus that he could experience and that he could be impacted by. He needed to know who Jesus was. And he wanted to find out for himself. It goes on to say this, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. He couldn't get anywhere near Jesus. And since he was so far back, from the path that Jesus was walking on, he could not see above the crowd. So his hunger compels him to do something extraordinary. You know, if you want to, I guess, um, achieve the same things that you've been achieving <laughs> For all the days you've been living up till now, just keep doing the same thing you've been doing, right? But if you want something extraordinary in your life, if you want something amazingly, extraordinarily new and different, you've got to do something that you've never done before in order to possess the very thing that will satisfy your hunger. The only thing that was going to satisfy the hunger of Zacchaeus was that he needed to see who Jesus was. Not to see Jesus with his natural eyes. But the phrase to see who he was meant to encounter and experience Jesus intimately and personally. You see, that dictates the level of his hunger. Uh, the rest of the crowd was looking for celebrity. They had heard about Jesus. They, they, they were looking at him from a natural perspective. Not Zacchaeus. Um, not at all. Um, so let's 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 break this down. He did something out of the ordinary. Verse four, he ran ahead. He got ahead of the crowd. He climbed into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. 
Now again, his hunger possessed him to do something out of the ordinary in order to experience something he had never experienced before. This was the only thing that was going to satisfy the hunger that he was experiencing to, to, to know Jesus in an intimate and personal way. Now verse 5 says, And when Jesus came to that place, now Jesus didn't stop. Jesus, the, the story tells us he didn't stop anywhere. He didn't talk to anyone else. The crowds were all there. Were they pulling at him? You better believe they're pulling at him, calling out his name, asking him for things, most likely. Um, but when Jesus came to the place, he looked up, because God is always attracted to hunger. He looked up and saw him and said to him, now, he had never met Zacchaeus before. Because Zacchaeus testified himself, you know, he had never seen who Jesus was. And so this is his first encounter. Jesus knew his name. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Jesus wanted to stay with the most hungry man in Jericho. Not hungry for food, but hungry for God. Hungry for truth. Hungry for Jesus. Isn't that amazing that he picked him out of thousands upon thousands of individuals and was so attracted to the hunger of heart that Zacchaeus exemplified that he said to him, this is the place I will stay. I will stay until your hunger is satisfied. Don't you want Jesus to dwell with you in that kind of way? Don't you want your hunger to attract Jesus in an extraordinary way? Not, you know, not in the corporate presence we all feel, not, not in the sense of even reading the scriptures and, and getting revelation, um, but what I'm talking about is can your hunger be elevated to a place that Jesus is so attracted to the hunger of heart that you have that he comes to you personally I, I pray to God that my hunger would grow to this capacity God I want to see you God I want to know you God I want to experience you God I want more only you God can satisfy Jesus picks him out of the crowd and people did not like this at all. So of course Zacchaeus responded. He made haste. He came down. He received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, they all complained. Thousands upon thousands of people complained, saying, He has got to be a guest with a man who is a sinner? Isn't that amazing? I don't know about you, but <laughs> Jesus came to be a guest with me when I was a sinner. And I thank God he did it. And I've told many of you this story, but I'll just I'll just say it real quick again. Because it's, it's kind of a, a funny story, but it, it almost uh, is like a story of Zacchaeus. Um, okay? Uh, and so... Um, I love hashtag hunger that attracts Jesus. That's so good. Um, all right, so here's the deal, guys. Um, when I was newly saved um, uh, under Pastor Tate's ministry, um, I don't know, maybe it was maybe a month um, after I was saved, um, after a service. Uh, it might have been a Sunday night service. We used to have um, uh, Sunday night services back then where we, we, we just lingered at the altar for hours. Um, but um, a young lady came up to me, um, you know, close to my age, um, and she said to and, and I, I had never met her before, I didn't know who she was. Um, she came up to me and said, are you Clem Salerno? And I said, yes, I am. She looked at me and said, are you saved? And I said, yes, I am. And she looked down, shook her head, and said, man, if you can get saved, anybody could. And I come to find out that I went to high school with her. 
she was a year younger than me in high school and I, I was not a good guy in high school okay I had a reputation um, um, not all of it was earned um, but she remembered that about me and then almost in a way that astounded her she almost couldn't believe um, that I was redeemable and here the people in Jericho are saying the same thing about Zacchaeus right why would he go with this man he's a sinner what about me you know I I, I had prepared my house for Jesus I just knew he would come to me uh, but Jesus passed them all by because he was attracted to the one who had true hunger see there's there's a difference between those um, who are curious for Jesus there's a difference between them and those who are hungry for Jesus and to what degree is your hunger you know uh, uh, realize I mean how hungry are you for Jesus um, are you a two-hour service hungry <laughs> Or are you a lifestyle hungry? Are you an eternity hungry? Are you, I want Jesus and nothing else, and I don't care what gets in my way. I don't care what I have to give up. I just want more of Jesus. That's the hunger I'm aspiring to, and I want, I want to encourage you to do the same. So, in verse 8 of Luke 19, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation I restore fourfold he was talking about restitution and what was the manifestation of his encounter with Jesus he was transformed from the mindset of a tax collector into a pursuer of God through the person of Jesus Christ and when he was in Jesus's presence he began to act in a way that was modeled by Jesus himself so Jesus says this to him in verse 9 and 10 today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, the anointing of Jesus from Luke chapter 4 and Isaiah 61 is for the Zacchaeuses of the world which I was one. And it doesn't matter how good you think you are. You might have had a, a pristine reputation. But if you're without God, you are Zacchaeus. Because without God, you are spiritually bankrupt. You are dead spiritually. And isn't it amazing that Jesus says salvation has come to your house. Why? Because God hasn't forgotten you. You might have never thought about God until right now, but God has not forgotten you because you are actually a child of God through the blessing of Abraham. And Jesus says, this is what I came for. See, Jesus didn't only come to save you because you were lost, but he came to live in your heart in a more dynamic way. He came to dwell in your house. Jesus was so compelled by the hunger of Zacchaeus, he said, I must stay at that house. Isn't that amazing? Could you imagine if Jesus was saying that right now? He's talking to the Father. He's, he's, he's making intercession for you. See that right in the Father. I got to go to that house. I'm believing that your hunger is going to rise tonight because this is the life that Jesus came to give you. That Jesus is going to visit you in a way that you've never experienced before. And so I just want to pray that over your life as we close. And, and I want to thank God for you that we're doing this together because all of our, our hunger is going to rise. Man, all of us are going to have these God encounters and we're going to give God glory for it because you are a child of the blessing of Abraham. 
And God has come not just to save you, but God has come to live in your house by dwelling in your heart and, and coming to you in a way you've never experienced before. That you would see the vision, you would hear the audible voice, you would feel the loving arms of Christ wrap around you and carry you to a place you've never been before. Hunger is the attraction that brings Jesus into a manifestation that's greater than what you've ever experienced in life. And I release that to you right now. I want that too, Rosa. Praise God. Um, all right, so let me just pray that over you, and then we're going to close. Um, Father, I just pray this blessing. <laughs> Do you know what amazes me, Lord, that these individuals have given up an evening to be with you and each other because they're hungry. God, there's not a lot of us here doing this, but we're hungry. And we come together to encourage one another, God. God, we come together to get into your word and to get into your heart. So I pray that visions, visitations, audible voice of Jesus will come to each and every one of these individuals. God, I pray in Jesus' name. And Angie, I'm praying this over your life right now, that this is going to transform your worship that you're going to begin uh, to, to sing out, not just prophetically, but you're going to sing with the melody of heaven. I just speak that over you right now in Jesus' name. And for everybody who has a worship anointing, I'm praying that over you. Rosa, that's for you. Dolly, that's for you. Because you, you have led, uh, been part of a worship team in your past. But I want to I want to revisit that with you right now and speak into your life that the heart of the of, of those who have been called into worship ministry is now going to be born again again. And you're going to be worshiping out of your vision and the word of the Lord and you're going to join together with the hosts of heaven and sing like you've never sang before with the hunger of your heart reaching out in love. God, I pray for every single person to realize this in their lives personally as their hunger now attracts you to a greater manifestation. Even as we cry out as Zacchaeus did, I want to see who Jesus really is. May we realize that, God, in the day in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. I love you. And I just speak that over your lives. And I thank God for all of you. Praise God. Well, this Sunday is Palm Sunday. We are going to uh, um, celebrate that at our fellowship. And wherever you're going, if, if you're, and again, wherever you go, please, please um, don't forget uh, to be a part of your fellowship and get involved. Uh, but be a part of the celebration of Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday as well. God bless you. I love you all. In Jesus, Jesus' name, signing off. See you soon.